Jason Voorhees is one of the most frightening cinematic villains ever. The sight of him alone is terrifying and sends anyone that sees him running for their lives. But everything we've been told about the Friday the 13th series has been wrong. In part 1 I discussed how Jason's legendary kill count was nothing more than the fantasies of a mentally disabled man living in the woods. In this video I'll explore the mind of Pamela Voorhees and how her grief turned Camp Crystal Lake into Camp Blood. About halfway through the second film, Pamela's mental illness was so undeniable that it made me question if Jason was supposed to be seen as a real character or an extension of Pamela's personality. As humans were all inherently afraid of many things, such as darkness, being hunted, and the unknown, fearing these things has kept us alive and as our communication progressed, we began incorporating these fears into our stories and legends. Monsters like Krakens, Griffins, and Werewolves are all just manifestations of our deepest fears. Unknown things lurking in the shadows looking to violate us, physically and psychologically. Think about what a werewolf truly is. Sure it's a man-wolf hybrid, but what scares us is the fact that it's the personification of our worst behaviors and many inherent individual fears. We're afraid of wolves, or any apex predator that's bold enough to kill humans. There's a long list of superstitions associated with full moons, and werewolves are transformed by a full moon. We're afraid of losing our humanity, and a werewolf's bite does spread a curse that will do exactly that. One of the most important things that separates humans from other animals is our ability to rationally communicate and reason with each other. But a werewolf kills indiscriminately, and can't be reasoned with or pacified. These are all individual fears that we have rolled up into one terrifying package. I believe that Jason Voorhees is much like the werewolf. I believe that his legend is a collection of individual fears given a physical form. This theory is meant to stand on its own and isn't an extension of part one's theory. All of the characters and locations are the same, but the motivations and circumstances are very different. Pamela Voorhees suffers from a dissociative identity disorder and never had a biological son. She had a mental breakdown and imagined that Jason drowned, and this gave her the justification to kill. Her killings became an urban legend, and the movies we're watching are the origins of that urban legend and modifications to the story told by different narrators. So why do I think Pamela is mentally ill? Pamela first reveals herself at the end of the first film, and her behavior makes it very clear that she's mentally unstable. At first I thought it might be schizophrenia, but her behavior more closely resembles a dissociative identity disorder, also known as multiple personality disorder. These are the most common symptoms of the disorder. These symptoms are all clearly present in Pamela, who kills in cold blood, because the memory of an event that happened 21 years ago is not entirely accurate. She feels no remorse and enjoys killing because a voice in her head is telling her to do so. In her short time on screen, I recognize three separate personalities. She switches from a sad mother oh, my sweet, innocent Jason. to a sadistic serial killer Did to, him. to an 11-year-old boy. Kill her, mommy. Kill her. Let me ask you this. If irresponsible teens working at a summer camp snuck off to have sex and your mentally disabled son fell in the lake and drowned, would you be overwhelmed by grief? Of course you would be. But would you go on a killing spree, killing people 21 years later who weren't even born when your son drowned? Would your grief push you to talk in your son's voice as you meticulously hunted down and slaughtered teenagers? I didn't think so. Her killings go far beyond rage or grief. Maybe the first two people she killed, but all of the others, 21 years later, can only be described as the behavior of a psychopath. Here's what happened. Pamela grew up in the Crystal Lake area and always enjoyed taking long walks through the woods. This is where her multiple personalities would emerge without fear. One day she found a makeshift house in the woods, and this is where the kid Jason personality was born. She always wanted a child but was unable to have one, so while inside of the house she would fantasize about being a mother, living a normal life, and taking care of her son. These are two of the three personalities that we clearly see in the first film. When she mentioned Jason to everyone at the camp, they ignored it because they knew that she didn't have a son. Her fantasy life in the woods was perfect for a long time, but one day, the Jason personality refused to emerge, and Pamela panicked because she couldn't find a physical child in the house. She had lost touch with reality and was convinced that Jason was a real person 
and not part of her fractured psyche. She searched for him, but obviously couldn't find him, so her immediate assumption was that he must have fallen in the lake and drowned. She returned to the camp hysterical and begging for anyone to help save her son. Since everyone knew that she didn't have a son, they didn't know what to do or what to say, and Pamela took this as them allowing Jason to drown by not helping. And this is where the murderous Jason personality was born. The reason why having sex is the quickest way to get killed in Camp Crystal Lake is because sex is how you make children, and that's something that Pamela wanted but never could do. She believed that the camp counselors took her one chance at being a mother away, so she couldn't allow anyone else to have the opportunity to make a baby either. It wasn't until after Pamela's death that we see her head and sweater in the cabin, but I think they were both there long before her death. The head and sweater are visual representations of Pamela's natural personality. Wanting to shield that part of her mind from the violence, she sees herself literally leaving that personality inside of the cabin so she can fully turn into Jason when she leaves. Make, Make no mistake, the protective mother is still the dominant personality. This is why we always hear her giving the orders to kill. I think that it was Pamela, dressed in the overalls and wearing the bag mask in part 2. This is why Jason is so small, clumsy, and easy to hurt early on, because it's really Pamela behind the mask. But what about her decapitation in part 1? Well, Alice hallucinated the entire thing. She was chased by Pamela but managed to escape in the canoe, and this is where she imagined the decapitation, and later being attacked by young Jason. We can clearly see that she imagined being attacked by young Jason, so why is it so unreasonable to believe that she imagined the decapitation as well? Pamela's true death would come at the hands of Jenny at the end of part 2. The truth was later revealed that she was the one with the bag mask and overalls, and those details would be combined with the story of the decapitation, and that story would grow into a local legend. After Pamela's death, the camp's long history of problems soon turned into the perfect urban legend. If one person died by accident like drowning, the story becomes The spirit of Pamela Voorhees drowned son haunts the lake and will kill anyone who enters. Or if someone is injured in the woods while playing paintball, Jason has returned from the grave and stalks the woods looking for victims. This is basic urban legend storytelling. But Jason isn't a real person. He's one of Pamela's personalities brought to life by her masquerading around the campgrounds with the bag on her head. Think about it. Why would Jason need to cover his face? Michael Myers was shown to prefer covering his face even as a kid, so it makes sense for him to do it as an adult. Any survivors will remember seeing the mask, and that was Spark, the urban legend. Jason's even mocked as nothing more than a campfire tale in the actual films. The evolution of his appearance and abilities are all due to the changing generations. As time goes on, kids aren't afraid of a 40-year-old woman, so now it's her son that's returned from death as a massive killing machine with a hockey mask on. And if any person, at any point, is killed in the area, Jason immediately gets the blame, like we see in Part 5. As the story's passed along, each new person modifies it to their environment and adds new details to make it more terrifying. Imagine a kid from New York that went to Crystal Lake for the summer and heard the original story. He wanted to tell the story to his friends when he returned home. He wanted to be scary as well, but they aren't at Camp Crystal Lake. So he adds in the geographically impossible detail of the very lake that's in the story being connected to the ocean and to New York. Now Jason can be anywhere, on the train, Times Square, on your rooftop. This is also a staple in scary story or campfire tales. The killer is always in the area that you're currently in. I live in California, so if I were to tell the story, Jason would have to somehow be walking around San Francisco for it to have any impact on the people I'm telling it to. Imagine there's a real problem with the campground and it needs to be shut down, like sewage, mold, or lack of funding. When the camp reopens, kids won't discuss county funding and mold spores. No, they'll blame the camp worker that snapped, or the hulking killer in the woods with the hockey mask on. Pamela Voorhees was a mentally ill woman suffering from multiple personality disorder and switches between an 11 year old boy, a protective mother, and a sadistic killer. Being mentally unstable, she assumed that Jason drowned and blamed the camp counselors for his drowning because they refused to help save a kid that they didn't know existed. The story of her killings are passed on and soon become an urban legend that changes details based on the person telling the story.